Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Rose and Rubini podcast, Making Sense of This World. My name is Manas Chavla, and as always, I'm really pleased to be joined by CEO and Head of Research, Bradala Rosa. This week, we're discussing all the various elections we have coming up in 2024, some very important ones. Uh, after all, it's a year that could change the fate of the world, depending on a few electoral outcomes. Uh, but let's dive right into it. I think first, uh, one of the elections that's most widely watched across the world uh, is the United States. Uh, and, you know, even though it's many, many months away, it's still already become uh, a contentious run up. Uh, could you tell us more about that, Bernal? Yeah, absolutely. We wanted to uh, highlight that 2024 will be a, an extremely busy year uh, for elections. They can, you know, depending on how they were, when they go, the world could completely change. As we know, elections do have the ability to change the course of uh, history. And when you had at least six of them of such an important uh, level, then things can really look very different at the end of the year. Uh, one of the last ones to be held would be, in fact, uh, the U.S. one in November. But we start with that because it's, you know, the key, if you want, for almost everything else. Um, and uh, uh, so far, we know that um, Biden would run again. It wasn't certain, in fact, that that would happen four years ago, but then decided that uh, he wants to finish the job. And uh, on the other end, we also know that uh, Trump is seeking nomination again, with some chances of winning again. Clearly, there are investigations and persecutions and whatever, not from the judicial standpoint, so all of these can change between now and then. However, if you look at polls, if there were to be a new runoff between Biden and Trump, that would be as contested as in 2020. And as, and as we know, it doesn't really matter the national vote, how many presidents have lost the race having won the national vote, but having lost in terms of uh, grand um, uh, electors. So um, it, it's the distribution of these people. Really, uh, so we will see uh, what happened, but clearly that is the one election that needs to be looked at in 2024. Right. And then, you know, the European elections are also being held, and more formally, the elections for the European Parliament. Uh, obviously, these sort of less uh, kind of, uh, you know, stronger, consolidated than a national government, but they still have implications for the future of Europe as a whole. Uh, what do you expect to happen here? So, European elections have been disregarded for many years because the European Parliament doesn't have much power. But uh, more recently, the European institutions decided to link the choice of the new commission to the results of the parliamentary elections. In theory, there should be this um, uh, rule of the spits and candidates so that uh, each party goes with his own leader and uh, commission president is the spits and candidate or leader of the party that gets more votes. That was the intention be in fact a nice thing to happen. The problem was that in 2019, when the Spitzin candidate system was launched, it was immediately uh, uh, kind of run over by governments themselves. Uh, Manfred Weber was the Spitzin candidate of the EPP, but eventually he realized he wouldn't have enough uh, votes to become president, so a new um, kind of compromise need to be reached around the name of Ursula von der Leyen and this and this. So uh, it, we really need to see how uh, leaders will try to make the new commission more legitimate. But the key issue at this stage is uh, that uh, the center right um, uh, groups would like to rebalance the access of the commission a bit towards the right. Because so far, PP, plus socialist, plus liberal, a la Macron, they believe that, you know, the commission is a bit more to the center left. Uh, so Meloni and her group in ECR, European Conservatives and Reformists, are trying to enter the majority of the next presidential, um, you know, the vote for the next president of the uh, EU Commission. Uh, and even Le Pen, Salvini, and their group of uh, democracy and identity are trying to 
uh, enter the race one way or the other. So there's full discussion on what will happen. And clearly all these matters also for investors because from policies of the commission, you will depend fiscal policies of countries and therefore given fiscal policies, then you know what monetary policy you need to do to compensate. So uh, there's much more that it seems a state with such knowledge. Absolutely. And then moving uh, sort of here at home in the UK, elections are also taking place in November. Uh, and we've seen the, the Conservative Party and, you know, several Tories MPs, uh, MPs reign as, as prime minister for almost coming up to a decade now. Uh, is a victory of the Labour Party uh, potentially expected? And what could that mean for the future of Britain? Yeah, so the poll suggests that Labour is way ahead. Even Conservatives party members say this is not an election for the Tory party to win. It is an election for the Labour party to lose. So only Labour can lose this election. And history is plenty of examples in which Labour and left-wing parties have managed to lose almost to won elections. Uh, so I wouldn't rule that out. However, we see that there's lots of economic discontent in the country for high inflation, for the effects of Brexit, for repeated strikes, uh, for uh, cost of living crisis. So, you know, all these things put the government in a difficult position. Plus the Tory party is as divided as ever. They're constantly fighting the demise of, uh, uh, the political demise of, um, um, uh, Boris Johnson proved to be uh, traumatic for the party. So, you know, it's uh, it's a bit in a messy situation. So, in theory, Labour should win. The question is whether it's going to have a working majority, and because that could determine policies. If it has a full majority, it, you know, they can run certain policies. If, if it needs to make a coalition, either with the smaller parties or enter a minor, effectively form a minority government, the situation might be radically different in terms of policy choices. One option that probably is not going to be available or as available as they hoped uh, or could have hoped was uh, a coalition with the SNP, the Scottish National Party, because as we know, after, um, um, the, the crisis that uh, uh, the party has suffered in the last few months with arrests and so on. You know, polls are really looking dire for the party. Having said that, if you even manage to bring 10, 15 MPs in parliament, uh, that could still be enough for Labour to have a majority with a very junior party that they can easily control. So, you know, again, the situation is in plus there. Right. And then now I think we'll move sort of to the to the global south, uh, you know, elections uh, coming up in the world's largest democracy in India, uh, sort of earlier on in the cycle in April and May. Uh, what do you expect to happen here? So we have published an article recently on uh, on India going the next general election. Clearly Modi is seeking for the third mandate, um, which he believe can achieve by being the most popular leader in the world, as some press reports have said. Um, but we argue that that might not be enough, uh, first of all, because every election needs to be really contested. Secondly, because the opposition has put together a huge assemblement of parties that are trying to defeat Modi. Now, we have seen something like this in Turkey recently. Uh, you know, lots of opposition parties try to get rid of a semi-autocratic leader and so on. Um, this might not be enough. In fact, it wasn't enough in Turkey. It might not be enough in India. So we will see uh, what uh, happens there. Clearly, India is important, we said, because it's a non-aligned country so far, has, has decided to stay with the US, but also be with China and Russia for other issues. So uh, it managed to be in the middle is one of the few countries that can afford to do so. But, you know, the result of this election might force India to, to, to change one way or the other. 
And then coming up next year, uh, sort of starting the year with fireworks in January 2024, there'll be presidential elections in Taiwan. Uh, Taiwan, as you know, has this incredibly geopolitically important position uh, for the future of U.S.-China relations. Uh, where will the sort of upcoming election, do you think, where will it take us? Yeah, as you said, the year starts really with fireworks because there will be presidential election in Taiwan. And as usual, the main thing will be what kind of president Taiwan wants. Somebody that reaffirms that Taiwan is an independent country uh, with its own policies and uh, its own institutions and um, its own economy, or uh, somebody that in reality wants to get closer to China, not to the point of saying that, in fact, Taiwan is just a province of China, as China uh, believes when these Chinese leaders reaffirm at all uh, stage, but uh, somebody that instead of having a confrontational approach is a bit more um uh you know well agreeing approach now um we don't know what is gonna um uh, happen at that at that point uh, which one of the candidates will be on the race and uh, which line will prevail what we know though is that uh, many people believe that um presidential elections in taiwan and in the u.s on the same year do offer kind of rare opportunity for China to increase its destabilizing practices towards Taiwan. Somebody even says if there's a window for an invasion, that would be one. Okay, because the US will be confused in which way to go. Taiwan will be confused which way to go. And in this uh kind of period of uncertainty, China can say, you know what, and I'm trying. Now I think this is a bit far-fetched. I also think it's a risk scenario, but I know also that people are talking about that, so it's important to discuss. Absolutely. And you know, speaking of risk scenarios, in March 2024, uh, there will be presidential elections in Russia. Uh, you know, uh, we would have expected a certain course of events had the war not happened. How does the ongoing war change the sort of election calculus, though? Yeah, in theory, they should have been an easy... Uh, I'm going to say call uh, Putin running again he changed the constitution exactly in order to be able to be re-elected two more times um, and uh, although he has given more power uh, to the prime minister with the change in the constitution um, he has also given more control of uh, uh, to, to the Duma and so on Parliament. Um, uh, but instead of this, after the war, things, uh, oh, with the war still ongoing, things might look uh, pretty different. Somebody thinks that they may actually be the time in which Putin uh, finally somehow loses power um, via potentially democratic process or at least severely diminishes its grip on the country and, and power. Um, in any case, uh, the, the Vladimir Putin that is going to run this election is not the same Vladimir Putin that ran the last election. He's been uh, damaged, his reputation internationally is also badly damaged. There was this rebellion by Wagner uh, Brigade that came uh, almost to Moscow and they fear the coup. So, you know, all these um, uh, elements suggest that we are not talking about the same Putin that uh, we have uh, seen uh, so far. In theory, by the way, as we are talking about this, there should be also presidential elections in Ukraine. But the law says that until the martial law is in place, there will not going to be presidential election. And of course, nobody in the country, first, would ever contest Zelensky at this point, second, how you possibly organize an election in such a situation. So unless by March 2024, a miracle occurs and the world is done and dusted, then there is uh, the possibility of uh, organizing an election, uh, most likely that is going to be postponed to uh, you know, the foreseeable future. So uh, these are 
really the key elections next year and that needs to be closely watched. Yeah, absolutely. I think from uh you know it's really hard to overstate the importance of 2024 as year for the elections. To sum up, you've got the world's largest democracy, India, you've got uh, the most powerful player in, in you know an ongoing war, Russia. You've got the next hotbed of geopolitical tension, Taiwan. You've got perhaps the most, you know, at least until now, the most geopolitically important player, the U.S. And then the future of the continent and the country, and you know, the EU and the U.K. Uh, so it really can't uh, be overstated. And, you know, it's going to be a very busy, busy cycle for uh, political analysts like us, uh, to say the least. Uh, so as always, Bruno, thank you so much for your time and insight. Thank you. I'll see you next time.